Um, we actually had mm -hmm. to cancel a trip that we were going to do out to Texas. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if Lily got to tell you because we were going to go. Oh my gosh, this is so fun. I don't even know if I've, we've gone to tell you yet. So one of the things we're working on in the innovation team is to get house call pro into trade into technical education programs. So like going out into HVAC programs and so we're going there to go teach the instructors how to do it, go talk with some local pros. Um, Cam from my team was gonna leave literally this afternoon but we had to cancel it because of the ice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the planes, uh, yeah, the planes can't land, so. Um... It's flying? Uh-huh. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, should we get started? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. So um, we'll just give you a little, I mean, Deborah, you you attend basically every event that we have. So you're used to the structure of it, but uh, we'll just go through, ask you questions. We don't think it should take any more than 30 minutes of your time. And again, we really, really appreciate you talking with us and, and opening up your lives to us, your business. And um, we just hope that uh, we're not going to take too much of your time tonight because it is late where you, where you are. So um, let's get started. Um, welcome. This is not a Facebook Live, even though we could make it a Facebook Live. Deborah is always on this. So Deborah, we've had the pleasure of working with you for a lot of years now. You're at almost every single Lady Pro event. You're very active in the House Call Pro community, in the Super Pro community, in the Lady Pro community. Basically, you see your, your name everywhere. So we're very familiar with you. And then we see Julia sometimes during the Lady Pro meetups, like peeking into the background and you're like this. <laughs> so now we have the pleasure of talking to the both of you tonight. So Deborah, Julius, please just Tell us about yourselves. Go ahead, Deborah. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Deborah. Okay, she had to talk a little bit. All right. So we used to be high, high school sweethearts. And um, Deborah used to hate the heat in their business because she told me, they're trying to work it down. They're trying to work it down. <laughs> that was true. That was hey, high school sweethearts. Yes. You too. I'm going to cry. <laughs> High school sweethearts, co-founders, yeah. partners. Well, actually what happened was he was so busy. And I think that that was where um, Louis Terrell, who was the, um, he was the contractor that took Julius underneath his arm. And uh, like Louis said, he said, I teach you everything that I know, but you know, there's limits to what I know. And so I think it was your second or third year of working with him during high school that he was already, <clears throat> he was already, when it came to install, he was already lead and he, he would lead a group of grown men. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, you were working 70 hours a week. It wasn't uncommon. And I was going to call it child protection. It's only in the summer. So, and uh, so Julius worked a lot and then he also kept it pretty quiet. But part of the reason why he was working so much was to be able to um, pay for his tuition to high school where he was. Going. I actually was there to build muscles. I still don't have any. Yeah. Oh, Julius. I didn't impress her. Well, he says that, that when he was looking for a job that he, he thought that if I, was, if I worked outside then I could get more muscular and that I'd be more attractive. And so, <laughs> He has this crazy story about using sheet metal yeah. and um, using it like a reflective sheen so that he could get like really, he wanted to get real buff and he wanted to get real dark. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> this is your fault because he was trying to get hot for you. Yeah. Oh, hot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so long story short, Juice and I uh, kind of lost touch with each other after college and um, reconnected on Facebook about eight years ago. And in the meantime, uh, I had had a, a, a um, career in medicine and he had been married and divorced and was in Georgia where um, the kids were. And, um, but now the kids are no longer kids. Um, one is mid to late 20s. The other one is in, is in the 30s. And uh, we really wanted to come back to Tulsa. This is our it's Julius's family home. And this is my mother's people's family home is Oklahoma. And so it was about, actually, we started planning this about five years ago. 
And it was about three years ago that we came back to Oklahoma. Um, Julius had that bug of wanting to quote, do his own thing. And I was just sort of going along for the ride and it took how many months to take me to kind of get the bug? I don't know. Didn't take very long. I think six it, months. About six months. And, and because the more I got into it, the more that it became less of doing something for him to help him. And, it, and, I, and I started taking more ownership. Um, and, um, and, and we both have our reasons for why we want to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, you probably might want to say what, what your reason is. I don't have one. Okay. You're his reason, Deborah. He's my reason. All of this to <laughs> impress you. Uh, well, you know, Julius really likes, I mean, you like turning the screwdriver. And yeah. um, so it's going to be kind of a challenge because, um, I mean, we want to, we're, we're looking for an apprentice right now. We'd love to have a couple of them. And, um, you know, it's going to have to be more than turning the screwdriver. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I, um, although we both talk about it, uh, we want to as quickly as possible build something sustainable so we can just turn it over. Um, we both were very fortunate that when we were children that we had some instrumental people in our lives that, that helped us to have aspirations greater than what a lot of the other people in the neighborhood had. And um, I guess if you were gonna characterize it, you'd say that we grew up in parts of what people called a disadvantaged neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We only knew it was home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my parents were always very education oriented. So were Joyce's parents were also. And so um, we, we want to be based and employ people that are actually from the actual neighborhoods where we grew up. And um, so it's less about what we want to keep and more about what we can what we can grow and then turn over to uh, someone else uh, to be able to take care of and to nurture and see what they can do with it. Um, so that's where we are. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when we started in the business, she goes, you know, we're going to have a management system and we're going to have House Call Pro. And, blah, blah, blah. and she went to all the meetings and stuff and she told me, we're going to do this like this. And I said, oh, OK. Yeah, at the very beginning, you know, I, I had done some <laughs> operational management. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that um, I had read enough and knew enough that how critically important having some kind of customer management system is. Um, not only does it help you to actually schedule, but House Call Pro, along with some of the other more complicated systems, allows you to be able to, I mean, you do marketing through it. <laughs> you do customer service through it. I mean, you can integrate, there's, there's so many different apps that you can integrate your, your accounting and, and your billing service through it. And so all these, all these keys to being able to actually grow and sustain yourself and do it well, and do it in such a way that the customer likes it. That is where I think when you talk about going to schools or, or starting with trying to teach people about the business aspects is to understand it's not just about you, it's about the customer and designing a system, de designing a business that's very customer centric. And customers love having a, a, a something like House Call Pro. They love getting the text. They love getting the emails. They want to see your picture before you come to the house. Is Julius's picture like this? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, yes, this is, I mean, wow, you didn't even have to talk. Like, we didn't want to talk about this software today. We just wanted to learn about the two of you, but I mean, yeah. do you find that the software, yeah, is great, but really people buy people. And it's obviously yeah, they do. story. Has and actually you, you, had asked, you had asked a question about one of the things that too, that I don't think that, um, one of the reasons why I when we mentioned the picture, we wanted to have a picture as we wanted a picture because we wanted the customer to know who's coming to the home. And we also wanted to have a picture. So if our customers had any problems about who was going to show up, because I mean, we live in a, we live in a very ultra conservative at times, retro conservative area. 
that that is not, I mean, it's got its share of prejudice. And so um, to be able to um, be very upfront, this is who's coming. <laughs> and if you want to cancel, you can cancel. Um, but we want it to be very purposeful. And because there are some people of color who make it a point of having absolutely no pictures of themselves on their websites. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, on any of their social media, it's very, very sterile. And, and they do it purposely because they want to kind of be real low about what their ethnic or racial group is. And that is something that we're very purposeful about having our pictures, who we are, very upfront. And if you and if people have a problem with it, that's okay because we don't want to be in your house either. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, right. um, so I think that again, I mean, I, I really like that feature. And I like that being very upfront um, and um, and not like hiding anything. Yeah, yeah. You know, Deborah, you all are building a legacy. And one thing, I mean, I always tell you this, but you really excel at your marketing. You really do. And I know you take a lot of pride in that. I mean, look at your, look at the signs in the background. Those are adorable. <laughs> like, one and two right there. Well, they're just the little cheap posters, but yeah, we do. We we tried to. You know, we, we We're kinda, doing marketing on a budget. Yeah. <laughs> but I but think you're doing it really well, and you're yeah, taking yes. advantage of the tools that you have. Well, we we tried to take advantage of that, and I think that you know one of the things that that is that um, we've had people who are um, who want to help us and have been excited about helping us and. Um, I've always been surprised at the amount of people like through our networking group or other organizations that if they see that you're really interested and you're going to pay attention to what they tell you, um, that they'll be very helpful. Yeah. Um, and so, and I think that that um, what we found is that we go to we've gone to like score meetings, we've gone to uh, networking groups. And there are hardly, there are very few people of color at those groups. Um, and I think that um, it is, people don't feel real comfortable, especially with some of the networking groups. Um, but we really try to take advantage of the many opportunities to come our way. And um, we just finished a business accelerator program that was put on by the Black Wall Street Chamber of Commerce. Uh, which is from the original Greenwood area here in Tulsa, which was one of the largest thriving communities up until 1921. Uh, you know, so, um, and it was designed to, to help uh, minority businesses uh, grow and, and stay in business. Um, because, you know, uh, it's hard to stay in business. Businesses fold all the time. And, um, you know, you, you have to have support uh, either monetarily or it helps to have somebody in your family that's done it. Mm -hmm. You have examples that are in front of you. Um, Absolutely. Um, well, Lily, I think I ha has a question on, on that topic. Yeah, so tell us about working in the area that you're in. What's been the best part of working together on Docs Heating and Air? The best part, mm -hmm. get to um, argue with each other every day. <laughs> Julius is like, that's my answer. <laughs> like, Deborah, anything else? <laughs> well, I, I think uh, I think that even though Julius is, doesn't, um, if I'm here to speak, he won't say anything. If I'm not here, then he'll speak a lot. And I think that um, I think the nice thing is having a shared vision and ha and having something that's important that both of us uh, are putting a lot of time and energy into. And we and and we both and our, we both are willing to put a lot of time into it. And and so so it's nice and 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 it's it's a very creative process. And I think that's what's important. Um, is, is being able to share that creative process. Um, but yeah, there's, I don't know, if, you know, we have different approaches. So I am highly analytical. Mm -hmm. We know that. 
<laughs> I mean, I keep, uh, I mean, I even deal with paper, you know, and I have, I have lists with check boxes. Okay. And, um, and I, I organize for the week. I want to get together and organize for the month. And, um, and Julius is much more, he, he's not quite, he's more of a, well, let's, let's see what happens. But he's the brawn. I really <laughs> what you two have done is created a business that puts together your two strengths and the cream or the, the cherry on top is the fact that you two genuinely enjoy doing it together. And for the three of us here, it is mm -hmm. so obvious the love and like laughter that you have together. And that's really cool. Like you're running a home service business in an area that is not the easiest to run a home service business in, um, in general. So just hats off to you two for really making it work and, and building your legacy together. Well, the yeah. interesting thing is, is, is if, if you watch Julius, he, um, we get our fan club. And I think that when it comes to customer service, and I think that's what's so important. Um, I'll talk about the importance of really respecting someone's home. And mm -hmm. it's intimate place especially for women mm -hmm. who you bring in your home is like it's a big deal you may smile and go yeah come on in and the whole time you're like you're also like yes yes <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes yes and uh you know julius kind of acquires his little old lady fan club very quickly um and i think it it's uh you know, it, it's that respectfulness that people feel from the very beginning, um, because we're both a bit Southern, even if we don't have heavy Southern accents. It's no, it's me going, walk with me, talk with me. Come <laughs> <laughs> along here now, darling, let's, let's go. see what you got going on at your house. <laughs> you got me say, like, oh, shit, that does not look good. <laughs> yeah. And, but there's I'll even let you watch me go up the ladder. <laughs> yeah, you're all how's that view for you? <laughs> that was one of that was one of his oldest customers used to joke about that. Oh, Deborah's reading the reviews like he said we could watch him go up the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> but even we're teasing I think that you know we're very much yes ma'am, yes sir kind of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, we think that's important to be, um, even though you to be a little bit more formal with people, so that you so that you you don't offend anyone. You rarely offend anyone by formality, and um, but by being too familiar, too quickly, depending upon the ethnic group, you can be very very offensive very quickly. Yeah. And so you know, from a customer service point of view, I think that. Um, that's something that we're real conscious of. Uh, and, and like I said, we try to be really respectful of people in their homes. He's still laughing, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's the truth, she said it right away. She, when I was saying it, she goes, walk with me, talk with me, be my, my friend. friend. <laughs> Julius, come I over a little bit. Like you, go, come, you keep going out of the camera, you're like laughing over here, oh. and then you're like over oh, here. Okay. You, need, you need your whole oh. face. <laughs> oh, yeah, we wanna see you. There, there we go. go. We stay yeah. in. And the thing is, is that the people, um, I think that when you have a, one of the advantages of experience is that you, you know when to tell people to, to kind of stand back or I can't talk right now, but the majority of what you do, it's okay for them to kind of be around. They get bored very quickly and they want to go back in the house, um, but, but being comfortable enough so that people can, can watch or see, um, I think is important. Um, and so that's one of the things that we that we that he say he does he tells him walk with me um, you know talk with me be my friend right I want you to see what I do because I want if because if you call someone else I want you to know the correct way it's supposed to be so you won't accept nothing different absolutely yes. that's what I tell <laughs> you're not calling me I just don't that's want anybody else too. coming to your house doing you wrong so now you <laughs> right. Well, yeah. <laughs> And then people will do that because they'll call us back later and say, well, this company sent somebody out and I told them to leave because you didn't do it the same way Julius did it. <laughs> they shouldn't be calling someone else anyway. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, it's a coupon. <laughs> well, yeah. so Deborah and Julius, I want to switch gears just a little bit. Um, you guys know that it is Black History Month. So 
I'm personally curious how you two identify yourself as far as African American, Black, mixed race. And with that, has that identification changed over time? Mm. Man, she got them heavy duty cars in her. <laughs> You know, I'm you know, we grew that. up in the, we were in the 70s and the 60s, and then, I mean, you know, hey, we didn't the words, Ugawa, Black Power, you know, and then we go into something else, and now we're all rainbow. Well, the, the thing is, is that I think that, um, <laughs> um, you know, I think, I th what, uh, now, Joyce's family is a little bit more homogenous than, than, than mine was, uh, but, but, um, up until like this current generation on my mother's side of the family, which is where we spent most of the time and the people that came from Oklahoma, just about everyone could pass the paper bag test. So um, because it was a blending of, of, of white Native American and, and African. And so, you know, Part of the reason why the reason why my people are in Oklahoma is because they came as freedmen and also on the Trail of Tears. Um, and, and, and we're members of the Creek Muscogee tribe, um, which is the tribe that actually settled Tulsa as oh. this particular this particular area. So this idea of mixture of different cultures and races is just a part of, of, of heritage. Mm -hmm. You know, my great grandfather was the whitest man I've ever seen. Um, but it's so funny. And then my, and then uh, so, but it was just, it was just a part of it. Um, so and, and you know, I will check whatever, however many boxes I can check. Um, and so, but I usually check the, I usually check the African American and the Black, and I check off the Native American. And my sister says I need to get in touch with my whiteness. And check off that one too. <laughs> you live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I don't think you need to check off anymore. But but you know, I, but uh, but so um, you didn't answer the question. No, but we identify. I I think that you know we just we accept all of which is a part of our heritage. And um, and like I said, I you know I hear this stuff about well he's mixed race. Well, you know our family heritage has has been has been mixed for you know hundreds of years. So I don't I don't understand that where people think that it's something so new. This is a this is a part of, of life and it's a part of the American experience. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I was just talking with my brother about Black History Month and we're like, mm -hmm. man, it's a shame that it's only one month, you know, but I think it's mm -hmm. it's a time for us to celebrate and really bring all of the stories and the history to the forefront. Well, um, I am black every month. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, it came from, it came from, you know, literally history books, you know, kind of erasing anything other than standard, you know, white person history. I mean, it erased all, all of the tremendous influence in the Pacific Northwest of our large uh, Asian population. It, it, it erased much of the ethnic population of New York uh, that, that was filtering in. So, so you know, it was, it was an attempt to, originally it was one week, a Negro history week, uh, and to, to, to reincorporate um, that into basic history. And I use it as a time, this time I've been a little bit busy, but I often use it as a time to, I put on Facebook or I've done some uh, things. She takes with, pictures of all the black art she's got everywhere around. Right? Well, sometimes, but. And puts it on there, like Shirley Chisholm. I mean, you know, you got to be old to know who that is. Well, I, I collect some, I collect some <laughs> memorabilia. <laughs> but the other thing is that what, what he's talking about is that often I'll share something about our own history, family history, because it, I think that people, people understand that we are history. And we met, we, our lives are making history. And so I'll put my picture of my great grandmother who was a mulatto and could pass for white, who, whose family came in the early 1900s to Oklahoma to the promised land. She was a school teacher, but unable to teach in the colored school because she was so light skinned and she was ostracized in that community. They didn't want in Kentucky a, a, a white teaching colors. 
So in Oklahoma, she had the freedom of being accepted and she was able to teach. And, and so I use her picture, you know, to, and I will talk about the history. Um, I'll have the history of my great grandfather who was actually a, a, a little deputy sheriff and spoke fluent Creek. And so he was a sheriff that covered a traditional black township and also out in the country and a good part of the native land um, because of his um, ability to speak fluent Creek. Um, so again, I use our own personal history um, uh, to celebrate and also to share with people. Um, and yes, I this year I did put up some Shirley Chisholm. She was. <laughs> To seriously try to run for president in the 1970s and so yeah I've got some Shirley Chisholm buttons campaign buttons oh, uh, I love it uh, you know Deborah we always talk about like how you are such a like I would call you like a master marketer especially for someone who you're doing it on a budget and you get really creative with it and we do really appreciate how you come to our lady pro meetups and like you you take all the content and resources that we're making and reuse it in your business and share it like you said we are history so sharing those family stories even within your business that fan club that Julius has there's more more of them who want to support a business like that you know so I think that'd be really smart on the marketing front too, not just this month, but year round. Um, you two have such incredible stories and, and history mm -hmm. that I want to, I, I want to talk about your thoughts on representation of black business owners, specifically in the home service community. You are very active in our Facebook group, and you're also very active in your own personal networking communities. Can you talk to us about the current state of just having POC business owners? You know, I, it is, I, I think one of the, one of the advantages of Julius and I is because we are working together as a team, he can be out in the field and I can go to events and participate in things. And I think that that, that makes some things easier. Um, I, I don't, I, I can't totally uh, explain why there's, there's some residents or people are, or people are a little hesitant um, to participate in some of the networking groups. I think that um, they don't feel just comfortable with some of the social aspects of it initially. Um, and so I think that's why sometimes people don't stick with it or, or stay with it. Um, I think it's they're faking. So when you fake it until you make it, then most people don't make it. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you mean? You know, we have heard people when we were at a business thing, they said, well, you know, I'm just faking it till I can make it. Oh, well, whatever. Sometimes. <laughs> no, I, 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 think, I, think, I think that, I, I think it's on, you know, some of the things that you, I, I, maybe some of the techniques people just can't buy into. But I think part well, of it this is, is the home services business, you know, and, and, and we're in some of these, uh, these people are doing nails and, you know, uh, you know, knickknacks and stuff like that, you know, and, 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 and what I'm talking about, we're doing like something that you actually got to have. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the thing is, is that I think that um, when it comes, I think it's important to share what your experiences are for if you are involved in networking so people can understand that the networking is more than just referrals. That your networking group can become, they become your unofficial experts. They become your sounding board. They are people that you can bounce ideas off of. You can even show off what you think you did that was so good. <laughs> Uh, and you can and you can learn you can you can learn from them so you don't have to make the mistakes yourself on your own mm -hmm. um, because you know you you want to you want to like I said you know, for me I, I like learning from other people so I like I said I, let them make the mistake I'll look at it you tell me about it and then I I want to try to avoid it like a pothole um, and so that's why I participate and, um, and again, uh, if you go in thinking that it's only going to be about referrals, like you're only going to stay for a short period of time and then you're going to be gone. Um, but if it's about understanding, say, for example, we, 
we had a discussion in one of our networking groups that you weren't there. Uh, the topic was, how do you thank your customers? And, and on one of the ladies in the group goes, what are you talking about? She actually is a performer. She's a comedian. Hmm. And she says, oh, I tell them thank you, but then I hardly ever see these people again. Well, she made it a point of writing thank you notes to every uh, restaurant, every venue, all these people who had helped her. She booked. I'm sure. What? <laughs> wow. So Deborah, what, I, what I'm hearing is that the two of you really make it a part of your job and your business to be the representation of the of the black business owners in your community to go and be a voice to go be sounding boards in these networking groups because otherwise your that diverse voice wouldn't be heard in business in Tulsa. No, I mean we yeah when we do participate in, in various groups we we do we join the Black Contractors Association. So we have yeah we have a contractors association. There's some different networking groups that that we that we participate in. And then we, we, you know, we participate in one that's called Bold Networking, which is very similar to BNI, which is like a classic formula. You know, we're in that too. Um, but that's just, you know, I mean, they become your marketing team. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and you learn how to give back to other people too. And I think that uh, one of the things that I think, I think that, that social media is just so incredibly powerful. And uh, you, you have to have other people help be your marketeers, but you have to learn how to give to other people too. Because uh, we've got, I don't know about all home services, but in HVAC, you've got these growing uh, uh, large companies that are gonna buy up the smaller entrepreneur in the trades. And, and to me, the small entrepreneur, medium-sized entrepreneur, they are in the trades, they are the lifeblood of small business and communities. And so I, so, you know, but, but you have to harness the power of, of what you can afford and social media is really someplace where you can harness power. Mm -hmm. You cannot compete on money with Absolutely. your companies, but you can compete on developing your marketeers that are your peers that will help each other and without spending those thousands because I mean they're spending thousands of, of dollars every month on ads on Facebook yeah. yeah you're not trying to do that and I hope that we can help you not do that too and what you're doing Deborah and Julius when what I notice when I go to your business Facebook page you're building a community you're building a community of customers and you're including them and making them feel like they're a part of your family. And that's, that's amazing. But we try to, we try to do a fair amount of, of like awareness types of things mm -hmm. that that helps. But, but, you know, but even with that, I mean, it, I saw what Anna Rivera, uh, who with the HVAC guys, yeah. Anna's corner. And I thought, you go girl. <laughs> <laughs> So I actually wrote her and said, oh, I just love that. You know, I'm going to imitate you. Good. <laughs> and so, I, <laughs> so I, love it. But I, thought, I thought, wow, you know, and uh, she, she was so cute. She goes, I'm running out of ideas. Tell her to slide into mine and Lily's DMs. We're chock full of them. Can't stop. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But see, again, that's where, you, you know, you, you ask and somebody, you know, I was impressed with her. She had helped with something before I wrote her back I had gave her like six more ideas and she was off running again again you know because she had helped me and it just goes back and forth and so I've got Deborah's corner now and again it's 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 about common things that happen and what to look out for and uh, and so we've also got you know Julius's pro tips too love that so yeah we're happy about is that we try and I got to do it more consistently to support small business Saturday, mm -hmm. highlight some other small business in the community. Um, because again, it's about supporting small business, not just um, having it be a format for yourself. Um, right. right, which is a good <coughs> into our next question, which is 
what or who has been your biggest inspiration along the way? I know you're going to say Beyonce, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's funny about Beyonce and Oprah is that they are like because because Beyonce is always you know she's us half the time she's got on less clothes than she been born with. Um, <laughs> So gonna work it, girl. So sometimes people don't. That's like Julie and Julius on the ladder. Gonna uh, <laughs> <laughs> work it. Yeah. People don't take her as seriously as as, and they don't understand the kind of empire she has built, and how she owns herself. She owns her product, and she's one of the hardest working women out there, and 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 pushes other people to to be their best. And you know, Oprah's like that too. I mean, she's built her empire. And mm -hmm. and and she's not owned by other people. So yeah, I do. I, I like them. Um, but I think is there someone for you that's been real inspirational for you? You you inspire me. Well, we, we support each other all the time, and I think that's important, you know, because you can't, it's easy to get tired or to get discouraged. Um I mean, Deborah learned all this, you know, she's, you guys know she's the next doctor. Mm -hmm. and did you know that? All right. Well, yeah. And then she learned how to be a plumber and she's dealing with all these people that are, you know, dealing with me, plumber, plumber Joe, <laughs> you know, and she's been dealing with the upper echelon people. And then all of a sudden she's down with us. Well, stop. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the hardest one is sitting right next to her right now. <laughs> Huh? So the hardest one to deal with is sitting next to her right now. Yeah. <laughs> and he's damn, that, damn proud that, of it. I think that I think that that Louis Terrell was probably someone who was really instrumental. That was the first. That was the first guy that. Oh, had, Louis Terrell. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. I liked him because I watched him get saved. You know, I know this is not a Christian thing, but I watched him. He was an alcoholic, drinking, smoking and everything. And he would pick me up and take me in his truck every day. And then we went in and these women put their hands on him and he fell down. He was barking like a dog. And then he got up and he never had a drink again. And he never smoked another cigarette. And he married the woman and had a couple of kids. <laughs> <laughs> and he ran around is the only person i ever know that actually did that that they, they won because we're here with the home of all robinson and everything and i watched that man bark like a dog and he didn't drink anything or nothing else and then he, and then he went on and he and i mean he actually was building churches and stuff it was kind of amazing well, yeah wow. i mean he, he you know the thing about louis is that he he did. He had a spiritual conversion and he did take good care of Julius. And also he would front you the money for your tuition. Yeah, yeah. He paid for my school. I went to a private school. He, he went paid to for private it. school and he would front the money and then Julius would pay him and work it off by working it off. And so, and when he did, he, at one time he, he had built, God, how many trucks did he have? I don't know, 30. 30 trucks. And so so he's dead now. But he's dead I mean, now. Yeah. But so much of what he did was when, when he was doing well, as he would just take it and plow it back into his community, into his church. And I think that, you know, it was just such a great example of, 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 of giving, you know, what, you know, and using that, using your skills and then giving back to the community. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I can't think of anyone right now. I think my parents, especially my father uh, is probably the one who is the most, uh, inspirational although he's been dead for quite some time um i think that your mother was a big community person mm -hmm. um here in tulsa well my grand my parents were they were in the barbecue business yeah they had a on greenwood they had they had it yeah on the famous on the famous uh, Greenwood Greenwood a part of Black Wall Street his family had a big how many they had one large it was one good sized restaurant and then two kind of three. like three, three satellites satellites wow. mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh -huh. mm -hmm. so that's definitely got to be your inspiration they built a legacy they did mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah they were in the business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. and actually when he was uh they used to child abuse him all day yeah i had to go build a fire in the thing at three o'clock in the morning every day it was just it that was, was my job we call it child abuse we it was child abuse we joke about it because how old were you about 10, nine or ten? 10. 
and he lived with his grandmother so she wasn't after her grandfather died so she wasn't by herself and um he would walk um uh, start it? the fire and start the fire it was about a quarter to half a mile away at three o'clock in the morning here's this nine or ten year old was responsible for starting the wood fire but you know it's like being a farm kid you you when you get when you give them responsibility and you show them and and you believe in them it's amazing the, what the kids can do and that's what he did he would start the fire every day and then he'd go back and he'd have lunch, uh, breakfast with his grandmother and, and then go on to school you really were gritty from the beginning yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's my work ethic. Transferred. Well, he wanted to eat too. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it is. It, it is. The, you did. You did bring up like that crazy story and Winter. So Winter is newer on our team, but Winter is really, really big in her community in her church as well. Just as I think you two are in your in your parents, and so talking about like inspiration. And I think Winter has a has a question for you. Yes, because I mean, like she said, I am involved in my church. I mean, I've never fell on the floor and barked like a dog or anything like that. That's pretty cool. But um, that led me to what motivates me. So I'm motivated by church and my community. What motivates you guys to get up and do what you do every single morning? Hmm. Wow. I don't know. What motivates you? No, you, you, you talk. Go ahead. Um, I think it's... Um, you know, I really enjoy it. I, I, it really, it really inspires me, and I, I really want to help people. And I actually enjoy doing what I do. I love it. it. I mean, it didn't start off like that. Not, you know, when I was a kid growing up. I mean, I told you it was for real. I was trying to build muscles, <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> it grew into a love. And I really care. I care about people, and I care about their homes. And, 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 you know, and with this business, I care about the business. I care about, I care about what I want to have, help someone be able to have a business because we are in, you know, we can, we, we can survive without that, but we, I want to, I want, I want to teach someone because that I got taught and I think that we can take some young people that can, and we can turn them around. And you, and you know, the business, it's always surprising because I, I think that it's probably, is it, um, uh, I don't know, pronounce her wrong, her name wrong, but uh, uh, is it uh, Irum? Mm -hmm. Irum yeah. Jones. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, right. You know, she's so active within her um, community there in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And, um, you know, opportunities of being able to do something or help a young person or just, do something, they're always there. You just have to alert yourself. You can either get like, say for example, it's Women in Construction Week is gonna be coming up in March. And so one of the things that I did today, I interviewed a young woman. She's only, she's, she's a junior in, in, in college and she's um, um, gonna get a degree in architectural engineering with, with a focus on construction uh, project management. Well, I mean, when she mentions that to people, they go, oh, that's interesting. I've never oh, met anyone. And then, you know, she's, she's a young woman of color and it's like, what? You're going to do what? So I'm going to do a, a piece probably on LinkedIn about her, just something short. And I'm going to use her actual picture for the posting to talk about parts of the people think that in construction or trades, everything is dirty and gritty and you have to be so strong and yet some of the absolute best jobs including the best paying jobs are the ones that do require a, a education a degree and and women would be fabulous right I mean, uh, and so um i get a chance to she's looking for an internship i know that after we do her posting she will be approached and uh, with, would you like to do our internship with us? There, I mean, again, you know, there's opportunities of, of meeting people, you know, and, um, uh, and, and if, if you keep your eyes open, you can, you can do stuff like that. And Absolutely. 
there's another woman that I that I met through one of our networking groups that is a welder. And um, <laughs> she does construction project management now. Um, and so I she's going to I'm, I'm going to do something on her too. Again, again, it's non conventional. Um, but <laughs> that's awesome. So it sounds like it, like, I mean, Deborah, we already knew this about you, how you have your hands in, in your community. And it really was really refreshing, Julius, how you said when you, you said, I don't know. And then you said, oh, no, wait, I, I do know why I do the work. I do know what motivates me. So I think both are really inspiring answers. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons that we, we asked to talk to you, and again, like, thank you so much is because we feel it's really important to share stories like yours, not just with other pros, but within our house called pro um, employees. I don't, I don't remember even how long ago you guys started with us, but we're past like, you know, like 600 something employees now. Like we have thousands outside of the U S and so like now we're able to like build all those cool features and everything now, but the three of us have a really amazing job of getting to have relationships with pros like you and get to ask you questions so that we can bring it back to our coworkers. So we do want to ask you, so every day our house call pro team is learning how to foster unity and encourage empathy and understanding in the business world. Um, it's, it's really important to us at house call. So over the last few years, racial tension across our country has been brought to the forefront as it should. And you two mentioned earlier in the beginning of this some of the experiences that you've had as black business owners in your area, but can you share with us how you navigate that world now in your, in your communities? No, I don't, I don't understand why people think that we had some period of Nirvana. Yeah. Like that is a, that's a, that's a falsehood. Um, I think that if we compare to like when we were coming up, uh, whew, he went to a private Catholic school. I went to, uh, he, I, I was a scholarship kid at a, uh, at a Episcopal prep school. And I had people in my class that wouldn't even come across Admiral, which was like, the, you know, it's like the Mason Dixon line of Tulsa. You know, they, their, their parents would not allow them to come into outside of South Tulsa into North Tulsa. I mean, and and things are so much more open and 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 mixed now that uh, you know we see a lot of improvement. Um, but I but I also know that uh, you you can't. One of the things about being a minority person or sometimes a woman in certain fields is there's always somebody out there who wants to challenge you as to whether or not you're worthy or capable. And if you spend your time trying to prove to people that you're worthy and capable, you're exhausted. And you can't focus on your work. I mean, it's constant, constant battle, constant challenging because people want you to prove that you belong and you deserve what you have. And so you just have to ignore that because it's always pulling at you. Is you want to prove you belong, that, it, that you are worthy. But, but I, I get to where you, I, I've learned to ignore that. Time to do that. And I think that um, uh, one thing is to appreciate that, that, that in so many of the, of the um, people of color and sometimes women, that they are often subjected to where they feel this incredible pressure to always prove themselves. Mm -hmm. And and just and not saying okay okay prove okay okay explain and prove to me that's really the case <laughs> that you have to accept that what people say they feel and what's happening to them is real and I think that that that's what helps foster good relationships and if someone says well you know that made me feel a certain way not saying well you need to be less sensitive <laughs> but accepting you know accepting that. Um, that you stepped on someone's toes, or you were inappropriate, um, and that and 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 accept people's legitimacy, but also, I had the technique that I have developed, and Julius has developed. He doesn't talk it about as much, is that you have to look beyond the stares that people give you. You have to look beyond the pregnant pauses. You have to look beyond those little nervous smiles that people give you when they're not quite comfortable. 
you have to, I had to learn and you have to learn to pretend they are not there. Be, otherwise that lingering doubt just keeps coming and infiltrating into your spirit and you have to push it out. And sometimes you, you end up, you just have to ignore reality. Sometimes, a lot of times. Smile right through it. Yeah, you didn't lose your, you know, the other person didn't lose their smile. You know, Julius knocks on the door and they saw his picture, but maybe they thought maybe somebody else is coming and they open the door and they go, oh, you look right through it. As though that person is somebody else who just said, hey, I'm glad you're back. And you have to pretend as is because nobody's going to give you the, your place here. <laughs> you have to claim your territory and, and claim your space. So you guys are in California, right? We're all over, actually. All over. You're all over here? Everybody oh, on this? Yeah. I'm talking about the people here. So I'm talking about the people. You're three, huh? Yeah. From, we're, Lily and I were in California together when we started working at house. So I'm up in Oregon now. Right, right, right. Virginia. Okay, so see, we were, so we, we were in Atlanta for a long time. And then, you know, so when so, when you're in Atlanta and you're dealing with diversity and things like that, when somebody's smiling at you, that's because they don't speak English and they don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and you're going, hey, 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 and they're going. <laughs> yeah. well, the, the, I, I think that's it. But yeah, the, um, the thing is, you know, Atlanta was, it has a very, very diverse population. Right. You know? And then you, when you get back to Oklahoma, it's a wholly different thing. It's different. Again, again I think you, you can't. But she was talking about how you deal with it. You have to, it, part of it, you have to acknowledge it, but you have to pick your battles. And, you, and, and a lot of the stuff you just have to plain ignore. I mean, I think that, you know, if you are, um, and you have to accept that certain things that you do are going to be mislabeled. Mm -hmm. to call it out but you can't call out everything you know if i'm assertive i'm going to be too aggressive you know i mean that's just that's just a part of it yeah. not me it's it's the other person mm -hmm. sometimes i don't have time to argue with you i'm busy <laughs> yep. you, got, you have a business to run yes you do so what kind of excuse do you have like when you're in atlanta and you go in there and you walk into a, a restaurant or 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 a uh, 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 a, a grocery store or something. And everybody's black. Now, is that a prejudice thing there? Mm -hmm. Oh no, let me shut up. A prejudice thing where black folk walk prejudice to each other. We're going. Yeah, I mean, in the Asian, I mean, I'm Asian. In the Asian community, it's really bad. <laughs> in the Asian community, you look at so there's a lot of like um, there is a lot of racial tension in the Asian community. But that, and I think that's is there a tension between Ch Ch someone that's from Vietnam and versus someone from China? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, but sure. like same uh, just as with black people you all get you all get clumped together into one and you receive the the same type of prejudice and hatred towards you and that's why we were so curious to talk with you today because you're both such wonderful people you're strong business owners leaving a legacy but yet here you are in 2022 still having to put precautions in place for your business to make your customers feel comfortable when they just really need a smack in the face to well, get there well, it, you just have to, I mean, I think that, you know, I, again, you know, I think that we just, uh, you have to pick your battles. And again, you have to, like I said, you just have to look beyond what's, what's uncomfortable. And you have to accept too, that we all have our, have our groups that we are so-called more comfortable with because of what you're exposed to. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, What's so amazing about the U.S. is just how diverse our population is. I, my European friends say, "I, you know, I, sometimes I just cannot believe you all have survived as a nation." Gosh. That and yet, <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious because 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 there is so much diversity, and depending upon where you live, you may or may not experience it. You know, I trained in Seattle. And that was the first time that I had been in such a large Asian population. And, and I was actually flabbergasted at how ignorant I was of the, of the I, mean, I mean, you would think like, oh, so when did you come here in 1970s? Are you kidding? I mean, like my friends would be like, 
are you kidding? I, I'm like sixth generation, girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> they're like take that back <laughs> but, but it goes to like as long as you're op you're open to learning you're open to having the conversation it's so mm -hmm. important between different generations between different ethnic groups um like i lily and i in winter we talk all the time about how it is so special for us to be able to like talk to home service business owners because if you put us right next to each other a uh, little girl from California doesn't have anything in common with someone who knows like the struggles and the achievements of running a home service business. Like I'm getting to talk to plumbers and you're talking with three girls who work in tech, like and, uh, about problems in our society and about how representation matters in all industries. And I think that's really special. Well, you have to, you have to be willing to ask people questions and not pretend that, that, if something makes you uncomfortable and you have someone that you can ask about it, then you need to talk to each other. And, uh, there, and there's a lot of stuff that we just don't know about. We, we, have no, we have no idea. I mean, I know about the tension between um, uh, like even at times Japanese and Chinese, it just sort of depends, you know, or Koreans. Um, and this dates back to world wars and, and, and tensions between people, you know, where, where we're, we're looking multiple generations, but in the same light where people's families have been hurt or killed by invasion, you know, and stuff like that. And people carry that stuff with them. Generational um, trauma. Generation, yes. And so, but, but, but it, unless you ask people and, and listen, you, you won't know anything about that. You're gonna go, around and, and um, not even realize how much you're actually offending people or you're just not gonna, you're not gonna know anything about it, you know, other people's cultures. Um, right, and, and the problem will continue, you know. Oh, you have to, yeah, you, yeah, but I think that, um, you know, I think that uh, one thing about the house call group, at least the Facebook group, it, there, is a, there is a fair amount of diversity within the groups and, um, there's a, and, but I also think that um, uh, people say, for example, I have a friend, Jamie Garcia, and she has a cleaning business. Everybody else, or, or a lot of other companies say they can't find anybody. They can't get anybody to work for them. Jamie has people who want to work for her. She just is, is so busy trying to find enough jobs for them. Mm -hmm. Well, they feel safe with her being a Hispanic woman who is the, the leader of that group. And she will treat them fairly. And if they have any problems, she will, she will interface for them. You know, she will stand up for her people. And, and her people always go out in groups, okay? And, she, I mean, come on. I mean, you want to be someone and because half of her crew, English is definitely their second language and go into some home by yourself and you don't know the people. That's scary. <laughs> it's very vulnerable. Yeah. So again, you know, she understands her people or people love working with her. And again, you know, if you ask her and you actually look then you can figure out why maybe you're having trouble hiring people <laughs> to work for you because, you because you're not creating a safe environment for your employees. But again, I, I hope that, we, that within House Call Pro or within the, within the networking groups, people can be more honest about what they're dealing with. And, when, and, when, and finding people to work for you is more than just putting ads on Indeed. Mm -hmm. It deal with understanding the, the cultural differences, and you have the same light also what you need to do to keep your employees. Um, and I, I like it that a lot of times we do have those kind of in-depth kind of discussions sometimes. Uh, Absolutely. I think you're you're right. I, I think especially in the Lady Pros group too. And we're very lucky in the House Call Pros group, which is now almost at 14,000 members to be able to like, there are pros and people from all corners and all creases of the United States and also Canada to be able to come and speak about topics like that, like hiring, like diversity and hiring, like handling difficult customers, handling racist customers. That is a topic that's popped up in the group a lot. 
and uh, marketing, which is our favorite, you know that, marketing and operations. And uh, we are very thankful that you're such an active participant in those conversations because your voice is really strong and we really respect you and you do inspire us with your story and with also just having the business that you do and, and the standing in your community that you do. So thank you for, for taking time to talk to us about okay. it offline. Bye. Yeah. Well, we'll, um, we'll let you all go. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No. We just wanted to, we want to be respectful of your time. Uh, like, I know it's late for all of you there right now, but seriously, it's so fun to be able to talk with you like this, Deborah, instead of just like, hey, Deborah, let's do like the, um, like the, the uh, meetups or something where we don't get to talk like this and I know oh, what's fun about what what I like about some of the things that go on in lady pros and and if you're reflective about the issues that people bring up it gives you a chance to to think about how would you react and then um you know what's your priority I mean I did some operational management types of things and so I I, I often have um I'm usually looking at what kind of system does a system need to be changed is it an individual issue um, how, how can you make it a win-win situation or is it negotiable, non-negotiable? Um, you know, so I, so I enjoy participating in those things, um, both, both because I like it, but the other thing, I learn a lot. <laughs> and learning from other people's experiences so that you can prosper from them. Because, I mean, we had a bad review. We only had, we had one, one. one. And um, people like, people like they, they're like, you know, stomachs are churning. They're writing these long ass things, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, just going on. But I saw what, how other people handled it. And it was, it was like, okay, acknowledge their disappointment. Clarify if you were in the wrong, admit it. If not, explain, you know, what your position is understand that only that you start off talking to that customer but really you're talking to every other customer who reads that review yep that, i actually know i think i know exactly the post that you're talking about i think we turned it into a, a blog post um okay i feel like we need a part two to this sometimes not next year like i we this it's been so long since we've been able to do like a pro interview like mm -hmm. this. And it's like, I'm, we're going to turn this into a blog post. We, when also what we want to do for you too, is uh, turn these into smaller videos that you can share on your social media mm -hmm, mm -hmm. too. So we'll cut them up for you. We'll have our, our video team. Oh yeah. Them. Well, we'll, we'll use any, we'll use any. I know. And um, just, you know, I, just like our lady pros. I mean, the idea of doing the featured lady pro is such a, such a yeah. nice idea. And I, I don't, I mean, I, I hope other people are using it. I mean, I saw that girl, I downloaded that sucker, uh, put it on our business page. It went, uh, I would, it went on my personal page on LinkedIn. He shared it. To Julia him. shared it. Yeah. I love Julia. that. Oh, I know. Man. <laughs> Julia's our, our, our feminist, our lady pro supporter. <laughs> you know, because the thing about it is, is that I was surprised the number of people go, congratulations. I'm like, well, actually, they did all the work. <laughs> but it, it, but it, was, it, it was so well, it's so professionally and well done that, again, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's something that, that is a nice recognition. We kind of, you kind of learn a little bit about the people, even if it's not individual. It, it, um, but, but also, it gives you something, something to share, a, a little bit of a shout out. Okay, yeah, do it. So we will, we will help create from this interview. Lily, you cannot, you can stop recording too. Um, 